Hello and welcome back to Introduction to Programming. Now today we're going to improve a little bit our Hello World uh, programs that we had earlier. And this is to illustrate what I've been telling last time about what linking really means and what these object files really mean over here. Um, I'm starting again with the test program as I've shown you many times earlier. And what I want to do is now make you a fancier Hello World. A Hello World program is basically where you just write Hello World on, for instance, the console, as we've seen up until now. But in this environment, in this console that we have to our availability, you can do a lot more. You can write things wherever you want, and you can also make a couple of colors, for instance. And to show this, I'm going to show you an alternative to the typical C in, C out commands that we've been using up until now. And for that, we're going to include a different type of library. So before we always used IO stream, not scream, but stream. Um, but in this case, we're going to use ncurses, which is a, a normal C uh, library. Therefore, we have the extension .h with that. And this ncurses allow us, allows us to put any type of character anywhere on the screen. It's still a text-based interface, so no fancy graphics, but you can do nicer things. So to start this, I don't use any C in, C out. I basically start with initializing everything we need for and curses to draw on the screen. So we need to in initialize the screen for that. So I'll comment this as well, so that we later can see what happened there. Then there's also a, a command that we can use to turn the cursor off. This is this block over here. If you go over here, for instance, you always see this cursor. I want to turn it off, so let's oops, turn it off. So we set it to zero. Um, let's also comment that, so we know blinking cursor. It's not blinking, but it's a cursor. It's visual, visual anyway. And then we um, also start the fact that we can use color. That will do a little bit more later. And now I want to show something. Now at the end, what we have to do for uh, cursors as well is that we have to do end win so that everything turns back to normal and we start and we end up at the same environment that we were. Um, so that means close the end curses window. There we go. And in the middle, I'm going to write something. So a hello world, for instance, this is a string. So I can just write this. Now this, of course, won't work. I need to put this as an argument somewhere in a function. And the function that comes with curses is called move and add string. So this moves uh, the cursor to a particular position. We can do this to, for instance, um, 10, 10. So this is x and y coordinates. Uh, and we write there the, world, uh, the words hello world. And this is a string which is basically a concatenation of many characters all together. So move and let's put it all the way over there. Uh, display string. This is a bit squeezed, but anyway, that'll work. So what we'll do now is, um, if we start this, we initialize the the window, so to say. We set our cursor to zero, and then we make sure that colors are enabled. Then we create a string over here in the middle and then we end. The problem is if we would do this, then we wouldn't see anything because then it would go back to the original window and we would not have seen our hello world. So let's in this case uh, create another function or um, do something that we'll see in a second, which is we create a character first that we initialize to zero, for instance. Um, and this is for the user input. 
So we create this variable C, and while our variable C is not equal to we can print to say Q, then we do something. And the something that we are doing is we basically ask the user to uh, type in a character via the keyboards. So this is the same as we had via C in uh, earlier. However, this is instantaneous, and this is really the key that you're pressing on the keyboard, not something that you type in and then press enter, as is the case with C in. And for that, we use the get character um, commands. So get the character or get the key pressed by user. There we go. So we save that, and now we can um, compile this. So we have our um, CPP file. We say we want to write hello, that's our executable. Oh, and there we see that we have several problems, and the problem is that we use here a library that is not a standard library. This is a library that's available, um, but, and this is why I wanted to show this, we have somewhere in the background an object file that is already available to us. The only way we, or the only thing that we need to do now is to compile our, um, our codes together with this pre-compiled object file. And for a library that already exists, we can do it like this. We basically say that, uh, minus L, this is for a library, and we use the end curses library. If we do this, then the object file will be compiled along, and then it will build the executable that is in this case called hello. And this works. See, in this case, there are no undefined reference errors for all the functions that we used out uh, of this end curses library. So now we can use uh, exactly this, and we can also test whether this works. So let's type it, et voila. So there, we display hello world at the uh, 1010 coordinates over here. Um, and we now wait until the user presses a character. If we press other characters, so I press F or R or T or anything else, this is all perfectly fine. But if I press the Q, I exit the screen. So this way we can create nicer programs with a little bit more. So what I did not do yet is add color. So I started to improve things here with the start color command, which enables colors. But for colors, we need to also first initialize a color pair. And this is done with init pair. And there we need to define a pair. So we say the first color pair is, and then we can, for instance, say color green and um, color black for the foreground and the background. And this is our first color pair. And if you want to use this before our hello world, we use this as an attribute um, for whatever we are going to do next. So in this case, for all the things that follow here, whenever something is printed, we're using this color pair attribute. So in this case, this is color pair. And we only have one color pair up until now that we now um, make active, so to say. So if we save this and try the whole thing again, so we compile and build our uh, executable again and execute this, now Hello World is in green. Right. Now this will enable us to do a lot of nicer things. Um, you might have seen on the YouTube channel that we, in the last year, uh, made this uh, Worms or Snakes game. Um, this year we're going to do something else, but also a little bit more graphically uh, appealing than what we've been doing so far up until now. And um, the next thing that I wanted to show that we're going to see today for Chapter 5 is that we can sometimes, or we sometimes have the need to repeat certain things. In this case, um, what we can do is we can create a loop, a very simple loop. Um, we already have this while loop over here. 
But the for loop is another one of those loops that you will definitely use again and again and again. And the for loop is a little bit trickier because for the for loop, um, you will need to know what the beginning uh, statements are all for. So between the brackets in the for loop, um, we're going to say how many times whatever is between the curly braces needs to be repeated. And it's using, in this case, a variable to, uh, to deal with this for loop. So we have this variable, usually people take i, and usually people take an integer, although this can be anything. This is the initialization. Uh, we start with i as 0, for instance. So that is our initialization of our variable. So we have an i, and this i variable, which is an integer, starts at number 0. And at the last position, between those curly brackets, we're going to say what happens at each time uh, we execute the, all the statements between the, the curly braces. And in this case, this is also a very classic one, we basically increment i, so we take i and increment it, that means the next time i will be have, uh, having one more, so if i starts 0, um, then the next time i will be 1, then 2, then 3, etc. And in the middle we say what the stopping condition is. So for instance, when i is smaller than say 10 again. Now in this case, we could, um, what shall we use i for? We could start at 10, for instance, and stop at 15. And we could uh, write hello world at the coordinates i i. So it, the first time it will be printed at 10, 10. This, the next one at 11, 11. The next one at 12, 12, and so on, until i is 14. Then the next time when i is 15, it will exit this loop. So this is more or less how this for loop works. And it is a very powerful way of repeating things with already initializing and taking care of a variable that is used within the loop. That's why um, people tend to use the for loop quite a lot. So let's see what uh, this does, or let's see if it, if it does what we intended it to do. So in this case, we need to write five times hello world. And we could do this, of course, multiple times, not five times, but we could stop here at 25. Um, that is the power of the for loop. So if we uh, compile this again, we have a whole screen full of hello worlds. Right. So now, in the next bits, we're going to see what this is all about. We're first uh, going to see, before we start uh, the for loops, we're going to also see uh, a new alternative to having lots of if and else tes uh, tests. So that is for uh, this particular chapter where we see more statements. Okay, so in this chapter we're going to see several more statements um, that are coming in handy now and then. The first one uh, is called the switch statements. And this is the, uh, very handy or very nice to have if you have lots and lots of if-else uh, statements that follow each other. Instead of, you could always nest them, but if those are four, five, six things that you need to test for, then there is a nice way of integrating this into one sta uh, statement, which is called the switch statement. So here is the, uh, a bit from what we could uh, use for the calculator example that we've seen up until now. Um, where we, for instance, want to test what command the person or the user is giving us. So we have our character that we ask for in the beginning. So we ask the user to type a character or to give us a character. And this could be, for instance, a plus or a minus or a multiplication or a division. And then we want to test where, what the user has given as a command to do exactly that command. Now, if we do this with if and else, then we have this entire string of else, if else, if else, if else, if else. Now, this is a lot of work, and this is very hard to read, especially if this gets longer and longer and longer. And this is one way of doing it uh, with a switch comment. You can do this a little bit more structured. So again, here we have our, our one character, which is called command and we switch on the value of this command. That's what the switch statement does initially. And everything between the braces here is then a, a, an assembly of cases. So if this command is the character plus, then we do everything that is over here until we get to a breakpoint. 
if in that case, or if this command is a minus, or the character minus, then we do this until we get to a breakpoint, and so on. And at the end, we can also check for the default case, that means anything else. So anything that was not covered by these four cases. And then also have here a list of statements until there is a break command. Now this break command is also very simple, but it's something that we haven't seen up until now. And the idea is something that it's exactly like what we've seen so far with the compound statement with the curly braces. So you could have here curly braces from the beginning to the end, but instead you basically have one statement, you could have multiple after that, until you have a break statement, and then it basically comes out of the switch statement straight away. So it, after um, executing these statements right over here, it does not go anymore to any of these here. It basically exits uh, this whole compound statement, and therefore the switch statement. So that way, it's a, a real switch. So you can, uh, depending on the value of commands, execute these particular statements or those particular statements. And that's what makes the switch statement a really nice to have comma, uh, a really nice to have keywords. So here's again the formal explanation. So you switch on an expression. This could be anything, but often it's a variable because we want to see what this what variable uh, what value this variable has. And then we see um, and test for equality for a number of cases. So if this expression equals constant one, then we execute these statements. If um, the, uh, this expression over here equals constant two, then in this case, we see a next uh, thing that you need to take care of with the switch statements. If you have multiple case statements after each other, also if there would be statements here, the rest would still be executed until you have a break statement. So in this case, if expression equals constant 2, or if expression equals constant 3, you would, in both cases, execute this statement list and then break from this whole switch statement. So that's a little bit tricky, perhaps, to see, but once you try it out in your own code, and I definitely would um, uh, encourage you to do this, you will see how it works. So here's an example where they exa uh, exactly do this for an integer in this case, where we test an integer given by the user through the common line, and we test if this is zero, we type zero. If this is one or this is two, then it types one or two. If this is three, then we type three. And if it is default, uh, we say it's not between zero and three. Now, this was the hope of this programmer here, but they forgot something. And this is to illustrate how hard it is um, to get this right in switch. Because there was no break statement here, after the zero, it will continue, it will continue and execute all the statements until it sees a break statement. And the same for here, for case three. It will continue after three all the way until it sees a break statement or until the end of the switch statement is met. So therefore, it does not exactly do what is the intention here. So also here, I encourage you to do and write this program by yourself quickly as a test and see what happens uh, because it uh, signifies the importance of where your break statements are met. So whenever you have a case statement, I encourage you to always write the break statement at the end per default. And if you don't do this, this is what the style guides or what our style guide in this case encourages is to also do this through comments. So if you have a case with several things that you then do, and you mean to go back to do these additional things, then you say fall through here, for instance. Or you make through, an, through a comment explicit that you want to also have these statements executed whenever you have case one. Okay. Great. So now the repeating things part. So as I just saw in the example here with the Hello World, with just a few things, we can repeat things infinitely. This is basically what is happening here. So if I would have uh, typed 100,000 times a character that was not equal to the Q character, then this would have been repeating ever and ever and ever. 
So that is the while loop as an example. And with the for loop, we repeated a certain piece of code, so everything that was here between the braces, um, for a particular amount of time, using a variable that we had to our availability within this for statement. So we already have seen an example of the while loops and the for loops, but let's see a little bit more or go a little bit more deeper in what uh, these two can do. So the while loop, as I said, is basically you start with the while statement or keywords, and between the uh, braces you say when uh, this uh, is true, we execute this amount of statements that are between the curly braces over here. And if this is suddenly not true anymore, then we exit this particular, then we stop this while loop and we continue with what is afterwards, what is following. The do while is exactly the same uh, type of loop, except that in the beginning you just say do, then execute everything between your braces, and then only afterwards, after the while, expression tests whether this is the case or not. So in this case, and the only difference is here, that the first time it automatically always executes this code. And it will repeat this if this is um, if this is not the case. So basically, if what is between the braces is the case, then it will repeat this forever and ever and ever, until this is not true anymore. So as soon as uh, the user input through the variable C is N for no, then basically this is false, and then um, the while loop is exiting. So kind of while, and do while are exactly the same, and you can actually uh, do several things exactly the same way. This has sometimes the opportunity or the benefit that if you have a piece of code that you always have to execute ex at least once, then you can uh, use the do while um, statements in a nicer way or a more transparent way. Now, to avoid a program that runs forever and ever and ever, the loop expression must eventually become false. So whatever is between the braces needs to uh, not stay true forever, otherwise your program will run forever and ever. Just like this program over here is now still running. It is asking for my user inputs and it is therefore still running. And it is not always trivial. Because the statements we've seen up until now, like the if-else statement, for instance, or an assignment, those are executed and you have immediate feedback and you continue with the other statements that follow. In this case, it's a little bit trickier. Now, most of the times we have just counting loops. So, for all integers from 0 to 9, do this. Or do this particular thing 12 times. And such a loop typically has an initialization part, a condition part and a step part where you increment or decrement a variable. And in that case, we come to our for loops that we have already seen. So that's exactly what a for loop does. You have your four keywords and then between the braces here, you have three particular things. You have your initialization, which is a statement. So here you can, for instance, say we initialize a particular value, an integer in this case, we call it with a particular name, and we initialize this, we create it and initialize it to the value 0 or to the value 10 as I did over here. Then we have an expression that is a condition. And in this case, this usually refers to the um, variable that was made in the initialization part. So in this case, when i is becoming 10 or is bigger than 10, then we stop. And then we have our step statements, which indicates by how much we, uh, we step uh, our loop over here. Usually you'll find i++, that means um, i equals i plus 1, basically, um, which is a statement. And this is followed by a body for the four uh, statements, which we tend to do always, because that is a safer way, do with the curly braces as a compound, so as multiple statements. And the variable i that we initially have here for our full for loop and that we kind of use in this loop is called our loop control variable or loop variable. 
Now, to quickly show that this does not always have to be I++, we could also change this to the prefix statements. Also, this would work exactly as we had before, so we re recompile and have exactly the same outputs. What we could do is we could um, actually say I, we've seen also, for instance, this particular thing, so we increment I plus 2, so this is the same as I equals I plus 2 right over here. So, so this is something that we can do um, where we basically skip one line in this case, and we have a, only a few hello worlds. So this way our for loop allows us to, with lots of, um, with just one uh, loop variable, to have lots of control of what and under which conditions this particular set of statements is being executed. Right, so we tend to do everything with um, the curly braces or with a compound set of statements, as, as you can see here. Um, you can actually uh, modify uh, the i variable in for, just like uh, is, is happening here, but this is very dangerous, and this is what you probably should not do. If you have a control loop, uh, a loop control variable, you should not mess with it in the statements. You should display it perhaps or use it, but changing it might lead to lots of errors, and this is tends to be really bad style. Um, Inside the braces here of the for statement, you can also embed lots of other things. Uh, because, for instance, here, at the step um, tent of statements, you can, for instance, put any type of statement, like you also can do a million outputs. However, also, this is bad style. We tend to make it very visible here that within a for loop, we take control of a variable. This variable behaves in a certain, of a certain way. We also make immediately clear when this for loop is going to exit, and then we execute a particular set of statements for a number of times. That is the way normally we should use a for loop. And of course, we can have for loops that are nested. So in this case, we have one for loop over the variable j, and then here one for loop over the variable i. And in that case, it will um, 20 times, so from 0 to 19, uh, print out on the uh, console a dots, and then after us 20 times it will print an end line, so it will go to the next line, and then print yet again 20 more, and again and again, and this five times, as you can see over here. So with this loops you can usually create nicer things, for instance in 2D as here. Now inside a loop, and now we're getting into the trickier domain where I would imagine you would not need this the whole time. You could also um, set the break sta uh, statement or the continue statement. The, the break statement exits the whole loop. So without testing any more what is between the braces of the loop, of the for expression, for instance, you immediately uh, exit the whole for statement if you see this break uh, statement. This is often used with a, together with an if statement, so if you have a loop and you have a special condition where you immediately should exit this loop, you can have the if statement, and if this if statement is true, you break, and in that case you break from the entire loop. The continuous statement is similar, but in that case you exit the loop body, the one iteration that you did, and don't execute all the statements that follow between the curly braces anymore, but you still continue the loop as usual. This is a little bit softer than this one. Right, so we should avoid, the, according to our style guides, these two statements, however. So it's probably better to just uh, ignore these for now and try to solve uh, our loops without any of these two statements. But now you know that these are at least possible and that this is a way to do things. Right. Now we go to an example uh, of prime numbers, and in this example of prime numbers, we uh, use a very simple algorithm to print out all the algorithms that are smaller or equal to, C, uh, to 100. In this case, we have a very simple um, uh, executable that we uh, want to build. We include IO stream, um, and in that case, we're just going to print all the prime numbers 
So we need to test, of course, whether something is prime or not. And this is what we're going to do with a Boolean, which is a variable, as you saw, that is either true or false. We're not going to initialize it, uh, but we're going to first of all say 2 is definitely a prime number, and all the even numbers that come after 2 are definitely no prime numbers. So we don't need to bother to even look for those. And then we solve everything with a nested for loop. So in this case, we first go and check all the remaining numbers after 2. So we start with our number, which is an integer, starting at 3. And we initialize this in our for loop because we basically say we have this number, it starts at 3, and it will increment all the way to 100. And this is basically what this stopping condition is over here. And we don't increment this by 1, but also here we increment number by 2, because we don't need to bother with the even numbers. We just want to go for the odd numbers. And then once we start it, we, have, we start with number equals 3, then 5, then 7, etc., all the way to 100. So this is already a, a for loop with quite a few turns or churns that this goes, this iterates through. Now, for each of iteration, we start with the bool, boolean prime as true. Uh, so we start with, we assume that this is going to be a prime number, and then in the second for loop, where we look for the factor, we see whether our number divided by the factor leaves a remainder that is zero. And as we've seen this, we can do with the modulo statement. So if the number modulo the factor equals zero, that means that this number can be divided by the factor. And then the remaining, uh, the remaining part, will de or there's no remaining part, uh, part, so it will be zero. In that case, if this is the case, then this number can be divided by our factor and our prime number assumption is false. So this is all packed up in this if test. And if we go through this for loop, which starts at the factor and ends at our number, because if we have something bigger than our number, this division would not make sense. And this factor also explicitly says that it should go for the odd numbers. So we go 3, 5, 7, etc. until our number is met. And, uh, and in this uh, for loop, we have our prime number being, equal, uh, being assigned to false if uh, this condition is met in any of those cases. Now, if this is met, so if we don't have a prime number, so if in this case um, prime is true, then this entire thing will false and we will jump and we will print out our number. If prime is false, then with this negation over here, it will set a true, and we will continue uh, for the next iteration of the for loop. Now, know that this is very bad style. It's just an illustration what uh, or how this continue part can be used. Now, this break part is the other example how we could use break within a for loop. So if we already found a prime number, then we don't need to go through all the other iterations, and therefore we say break. And this means that we immediately break the entire for loop statements over here, and we won't be going immediately and continue with this here. Okay, so this is an illustration how the for loop can be used as a nested loop, and how this break statement and how this continuous statement can be used, just as an illustration. Here, and this is in the slides, we can see what is happening. So in this case, we're going through an animation where we start with the output 2. Then we uh, have our number for our first for loop set to 3. Um, it, is not, uh, uh, it is still smaller than 100, so it's not equal or higher than 100. So our prime is set to 3. Uh, our factor is set to 3. Um, our factor is not smaller than number, so we exit prime is true, so we exit uh, and by saying that 3 is also a prime number. Then we add 2 to uh, 3, which is 5. 5 is smaller than 100. Um, we have factor then set to 3 again. 3 is smaller than 5, so we go into this if statement. Then um, we have 5 divided by 3, leaves a remainder. So in that case, we add three, uh, 2 again. 5 is smaller than 5? No, so we exit this loop again. Also here, 5 
is uh, a prime number and therefore is uh, put out to the C out. We add that to 7. 7 is smaller than 100, so prime is set to true. Factor is 3. Factor is smaller than 7. So in this case, 7 divided by 3 does not have a remaining. So in this case, we go to 5 and so on until we have 9. In this case, 9 is not a prime number. So let's see what happens here. We set prime to, three, uh, to true, the factor to 3. In this case, 3 is smaller than 9. And then if 9 divided by 3 equals 0 uh, uh, is uh, something that with, uh, with a remainder of uh, uh, 0, in this case, that is the case, we go in this if loop, we set prime to false, and then break the entire for loop. So we continue then to the if statements, and in this case we have prime is false, so not false is true in this case, so if true, then we continue, and we don't print this number in this case, and so on. Right, so in this case, um, we want to sometimes, for our uh, programs, check whether we really think what is happening is actually happening some type of a, a, a sanity check. And this is exactly what we can do with assertions, because with loops, our programs are becoming a lot more complex. And with assertions, we can do exactly that. We can include assertions, because this is part of a library, by doing exactly this over here. And then we have our function to, a function to our availability, which is assert, where we can assert for a certain expression. And in this case, this expression is checked. If uh, the program, our program, reaches such an assert function or assert statements, and what is between those uh, braces is false, then the program will halt with an error message. And in that case, um, uh, we can make sure that uh, something that we constantly test in our program is checked for. So this is kind of a shortcut where we don't explicitly have to use an if-then test. Later, when we go to more, the more advanced C++, Parts, we will see that there are uh, other options, like throwing an error, for instance. Uh, but an assertion is, for now, a very nice way of making sure that something is exactly uh, the way you intend it to be. Again, this is a little bit more advanced. You probably don't completely need this all the time, but it's nice to know. Right, so to summarize what we've done up until now, we've seen the switch statement, which kind of saves time and uh, a safe space, especially, and makes a more um, structured uh, display of what you're test testing for. You test for an expression, usually a variable, and you test for this variable being of a certain value. And then you can do this with the case statements. You just have to make sure that those breaks are always there, and if they're not, you should add a comment to say that there is a fall through. So in this case here, from uh, this case uh, to this case over here. Then we've seen multiple types of loops, the while loop, the do while loop, where the do while loop always uh, executes these statements over here that are between the do and the while keywords, and the for loop. Right, so this is all for this particular chapter. I'll see you next time.